U.S. and Russian officials are meeting in Switzerland this morning, hoping to lower the temperature in Eastern Europe. Russia has 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine, fueling fears of an invasion. The United States is threatening massive consequences if Russia doesn't back down. Dale heard reports on the ongoing escalation. The U.S. is reportedly ready to discuss a deal limiting future missile deployments in Ukraine and pulling back on NATO military exercises in Eastern Europe if Russia will back off on Ukraine. This as tens of thousands of Russian troops remain camped on Ukraine's border ready to invade. But Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking Sunday did not sound hopeful about achieving success in the talks at least right away. I don't think we're going to see any breakthroughs next week. We're going to listen to their concerns, they'll listen to our concerns, and we'll see if there are grounds for progress. But to make actual progress, it's very hard to see that happening when uh, there's an ongoing escalation. Russian President Vladimir Putin wants guarantees that Ukraine will not be allowed into NATO and that NATO will pull back from former Soviet states. Russian officials say former Secretary of State James Baker made this promise to them at the end of the Cold War. The U.S. says that's not true. Historically, Russia views Ukraine as a strategic buffer against invasion. Some say Putin also sees it as a key to reasserting Russia's global influence, if he can dominate it. They're in a bit of a difficult position because the Russian, the Russian demands are non-starters, right? And, and everyone, everyone uh, on the Western side, on the NATO side, agrees that they're non-starters. And yet here is Putin and Russia kind of with all the cards, with this massive troop buildup on the Ukrainian borders. Blinken says the U.S. and NATO are prepared to punish Russia if it moves on Ukraine. There will be uh, massive consequences for Russia if it renews its aggression, economic, financial, uh, and other consequences, as well as uh, NATO uh, almost certainly having to reinforce its positions on its eastern flank. Anti-Russian protesters took to the streets of Ukraine's capital, Kiev, on Sunday, fearful that Putin may not be bluffing about an invasion. We are afraid that uh, uh, Russia will attack Ukraine in the coming months. We all build this country, we uh, love it, we believe in its future. This is happening as Russia seeks to prop up another old Soviet state, sending troops to Kazakhstan to quell unrest after government forces opened fire and killed scores of protesters angry about rising fuel prices. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, CBN Chief International Correspondent Gary Lane joins us now. So, Gary, what do you make of the Russian claims that somehow or other there was a promise uh, from the Secretary of State, um, Jim Baker? Uh, was, was anything in writing on that? On that? Uh, no, I mean, as far as we know, there wasn't. But uh, I wouldn't put it past Baker to have done that, to have said that to them. Uh, it, it could very well be true. Of course, the United States government is denying it. But, Gordon, the, the key here is Ukraine is very important to Russia and to Europe. Ukraine has long been, as Dale mentioned, this military buffer for invasion from Europe to uh, Russia. So Putin sees it as that. But also, during the Soviet days, Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. It provided wheat and other crops uh, to feed the people of the USSR. And today it is now uh, a place of energy. Russia is dependent on energy. About 60 to 70 percent of its exports come from energy. You can see these pipelines going right from Russia through Ukraine. Oil pipeline in the blue here, in the red are the gas pipelines. There are several of each going right through Ukraine. And then, of course, the latest one, the new one, is coming from northern uh, Russia uh, down into Germany. And that is a Nord Stream 2. And that is just about ready to go online, Gordon. Well, uh, so you're, you're saying this is uh, mostly economic, and in some instances, there, Russia is making a claim that this is somehow related to their um, security, the security of their borders? Well, there, there is security. Look, 
economics is security, isn't it? Uh, Russia is hurting economically, and when you're dependent, nobody wants anything from Russia. What, what do they export? They basically export military hardware and energy. And right now, Europe is dependent on Russia for energy. Donald Trump warned them about that. He said, look, the U.S. can give you cheap energy. Now they're energy dependent on Russia. They will become more so, and Putin will have much leverage over the Europeans. Well, let's go back to the treaties. Um, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, James Baker said he never made that promise. Uh, and the uh, current Secretary of State is saying, going back to spheres of influence, the famous Potsdam Conference, and, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be spheres of influence where Russia gets control of Eastern Europe, uh, the U.S. gets control of certain areas, Great Britain gets control of certain areas. Uh, all of that is old and should never be revisited. But there is a writing that, that Russia signed, and this is back when Ukraine gave up their nuclear stockpile. And at that point in time, Ukraine had the third largest nuclear stockpile in the world, uh, which, you know, the, by any account, that's enormous. And they gave it all up in return from a promise from Russia. And there were two promises in this uh, Budapest Memorandum. One is Russia would never threaten them economically, and then two, Russian would, Russia would never threaten them militarily. Uh, why isn't that front and center in this current discussion? Why is anyone listening to um, the, I, I got to call it for what I think it is, the gaslighting coming from Russia right now? Well, again, Russia holds all the cards. When you are energy dependent on Russia, Putin can turn off the spigots at any time. Now, as far as that agreement goes, uh, I, my understanding, it was not a treaty. It was a memorandum. Uh, so he's not bound by treaty. He's bound by a memorandum and by his word. Uh, you can't trust Putin, former KGB agent. Uh, he's going to do what he believes is in the best interests of Russia, no one else. But we'll have to see because there will be consequences economically, tough sanctions against Russia if he moves forward with an invasion. I don't think he'll do that. I think Putin's going to take it as far as he can and get as much as he can without doing that. Well, what do you think the U.S. is going to give so that an invasion is called off? Uh, probably the pullback of missiles, also agreement not to have military exercises near the Russian border. But as far as Ukraine is concerned, and, uh, well, I, you know, they may eventually say, no, uh, we will not allow Ukraine to be a part of NATO. Uh, but basically, the position right now of the United States is what happens with Ukraine is up to the Ukrainians, not to the Russians. All right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for the insight. In other news, a controversial new voting law is now in effect in New York. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. The law allows non-U.S. citizens to vote in local elections in New York City. More than 800,000 people, including those authorized to work in the United States, and those who've been lawful permanent residents for more than 30 days can now cast their ballots. It also includes DREAMers, the children of parents who came to the United States illegally. The law applies only to city elections, such as mayor, city council members, borough presidents, comptroller, and public advocates. Special ballots are being prepared to prevent voting in statewide and national contests. Investigators believe an electric space heater is the cause of a Sunday fire in New York City apartment building that took the lives of at least 19 people, including nine children. The heater apparently setting fire to a mattress in one of the apartments. An open door let smoke spread through the three-story building in the Bronx. More than 200 firefighters were on the scene, smashing windows and using ladders to save those trapped. Dozens were rescued, but one woman lost her entire family. To see it in a mother's eyes as I held her, who lost her entire family. It's hard to fathom what they're going through. We will not forget you. We will not abandon you. We are here for you. The governor plans to uh, establish a compensation fund for the victims to help them secure housing. Well, both sides in the abortion battle are waiting on a critical ruling from the Supreme Court. If the justices overturn Roe v. Wade this term, some states are ready to ban the practice altogether. But California is going in the opposite direction, moving to be an abortion sanctuary. Senior National Affairs correspondent Heather Sells reports. California is already preparing for what could be a post-Roe America. Its new abortion council has released a guide that positions the state to rapidly increase the number of abortions performed 
and pay for them as well. It's really a shocking document, and I think it shows that there is really just an absolute desperation on the ha on behalf of some of the abortion industry uh, to do everything they can to thwart pro-life movement uh, and pro-life states across the country. If the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe, states would then be free to craft their own laws on the issue. California leaders believe their abortion-friendly climate would attract women from states choosing to ban the procedure. California is relying on predictions from the Guttmacher Institute and Abortion Advocate, which shows the number of women choosing California for abortions could jump from 46,000 to 1.4 million. That is close to a 3,000 percent spike. We think that everyone should be able to access the care they need and make their own decisions about their family's future. And the state may make that so-called care, including travel expenses, free to any woman who can't pay. Gavin Newsom is actually talking about paying people, paying women with unplanned pregnancies, to fly to the state of California, to pay for their hotel rooms, to cover all of their even work-related expenses if they have to take unpaid time off so that they can come here and end the lives of their unborn children. It's all part of California's effort to become an abortion capital, or what supporters call a model for reproductive freedom. I think California, as a value statement, uh, wants to be that beacon, but we've got work to do. The Abortion Council is also pushing back on religious liberty by calling for religiously affiliated hospitals to provide abortions. And it says the state must, quote, combat harmful and misleading information perpetuated by crisis pregnancy centers. One pregnancy center association, NIFLA, tells CBN News that's a false narrative. That's because the State Department of Health has granted medical licenses to its facilities that perform ultrasounds, plus its 2018 Supreme Court win that protected its free speech. California also wants better data on abortion, virtually ignoring that it's one of just three states refusing to provide its own abortion numbers to the CDC. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather Gordon. Many expecting a complete reshaping of the landscape after this upcoming decision. And that's been the prediction for some time, that if Roe versus Wade gets either reduced or reversed by the Supreme Court, it then falls back on the various states. And the various states will then have the ability to either have abortion sanctuaries, which clearly California is going to, or the, the so-called trigger laws that as soon as Roe versus Wade is reversed, uh, the new, those laws go on the books and, and are pretty much automatic. Uh, so abortions will have a patchwork, if you will, of different laws regarding it. But boy, California is taking it to a whole new, new level where on the taxpayer uh, in California, the state taxpayers will pay for the airfare and the lodging of people, some women seeking abortions in the state. Uh, that is, uh, that's a whole nother level. And it just shows you how deep the divide is, how deep the ideology is. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed at, at how uh, the pro-abortion crowd wants to take it to the moment of birth, uh, the late-term abortions, all of this. It just makes no sense to me. Can we please have a culture of life? Can we please have a culture where we encourage women to give birth and to become mothers. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place? Uh, and when you start thinking about future generations, uh, why are we killing off our future? It absolutely makes no sense to me. Uh, I don't understand it outside the, you know, the, the spiritual that who comes to seek and to kill and destroy? Can we please encourage people, women, to give us hope for the future? and become mothers. An author and a photographer tell the history of the holiest city on earth and describe its current revival on the way to becoming the center of the world's attention. Their book contains some of the oldest photographs of Jerusalem ever taken. It also explains what Jerusalem rising means in terms of biblical prophecy. Chris Mitchell has the story. 
Author Doug Hershey uses past and current photographs to show the extraordinary transformation of Jerusalem over the past 175 years. The book continues Hershey's unique look at prophecy and the Holy Land. Much like Israel Rising documented the revival of the land, Jerusalem Rising is documenting the uh, fulfillment of, or at least the beginning processes of these biblical prophecies about Jerusalem being restored and what it's leading to. Hershey and adventure photographer Eden Ram combed the city for just the right angles to capture its past and present. Eden, find up the top, there he goes. Looking at, uh, you can kind of look through the fence here. It'll look better when we um, you see the actual photos, but some of all of that stuff right in there is, uh, is what he's getting a shot of from back in the early 1900s. To be able to go to some of these locations and find the exact locations where uh, a photographer set up 175 years ago to capture what Jerusalem looks like and then go back today to the exact same location. Some of the oldest photos of Jerusalem ever taken were from 1844 and we have several of those in Jerusalem Rising and all of those I don't think have ever been recreated ever. One of those before and after photos takes place here just outside the Jaffa Gate of Jerusalem's old city walls. It looks back from this spot towards what's known as the Tower of David. Hershey says most any city on earth may look different over the course of 100 years, but Jerusalem is unique. There's no other city on earth that's had its history foretold from its destruction to its desolation to a revival as a world player. So to be able to see all of that beginning to unfold in our day is really amazing. And so that's a lot of what's been documented in Jerusalem Rising. Hershey says some of those prophecies can be seen on the streets here. In Zechariah 8, God says that he's going to return to the city and he's going to dwell with his people, which is a, a profound statement for one of the prophets to say that God's saying, I'm going to return to Jerusalem and dwell with my people. He says that the old men and old women will dwell safely in the streets, leaning on their canes, and the children will be playing in the streets, and the nations will begin to flood to Jerusalem. And before COVID, Israel set records for tourism. Never before in history have the nations flooded to Jerusalem the way that they are in our day. And now, clearly, in Zechariah 8, it's in the context of coming to worship the king in Jerusalem, but it's undeniable that these are very beginning stages, historically, that we're seeing unfold in the city that have just never happened before. Hershey says, if we want to understand Jerusalem, we must look to the scriptures. Ultimately, if we continue reading the scriptures, if we believe what the prophet said, Jerusalem is going to be a seat of ruling power for a Jewish king. Ezekiel 5.5 5 says that God has placed Jerusalem in the center of the earth. So locationally, it's already in the center of the earth. And one day soon, and even beginning now, it's already becoming the center of the world's attention. A city that for thousands of years has stood at the crossroads of history and prophecy. Jerusalem has been conquered and reconquered multiple times. It's changed hands over 40 times. It's been completely leveled at least twice. There's been literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years where the city has just laid desolate, according to eyewitness accounts. Now we're at a time where things are starting to revive. So prophetic words from Zechariah 8 or Isaiah or any of these prophets about Israel, about Jerusalem, where once we thought were allegorical or spiritual or just abstract concepts, we're finding that God is doing exactly what he said. Never before have these prophecies been fulfilled in such a dramatic and significant way, and it's happening in our day in a really powerful and unique way. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Jaffa Gate, Jerusalem's Old City. We're seeing more archaeology come out of, uh, coming out of Jerusalem than we have at any point in history. All of it is proving the account, the biblical account, the account in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing what's happening, and it's literally happening in our generation. Here's a scripture for you. It's from Isaiah 52, verse 2. Uh, shake off your dust. That's what the prophet is calling for. And so literally, as we're uncovering all of these things, whether it's the city of David, all the area around the Temple Mount, uh, the, the incredible historical record that's literally written in stone, as we shake off that dust, we find that Jerusalem will take its place. And that's what the prophet called for. It will be seated. It will be a, a center. And we will all go there. And that is the place where Messiah will rule and reign. Well, the book is called Jerusalem Rising, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Terry? 30 years.
That's how long Anthony Ray Hinton languished on death row for a crime he didn't commit. His cell was only 30 feet from the electric chair known as Yellow Mama. The first few years Anthony spent hating the men responsible for his death sentence. Then he made a decision that completely transformed his life and also influenced the lives of everyone around him. This is his extraordinary story of redemption. Birmingham, Alabama, 1985. Police arrest Anthony Ray Hinton, the man they believe committed three armed robberies that left two restaurant managers dead and a third wounded. To be accused of murder, it, to me, it, it don't get no worse than that. Anthony, or Ray, still remembers the arresting officer's chilling words. There's five things that are going to convict you. Number one, you're black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him. Whether you shot him or not, believe me, I don't care. He said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, you're going to have an all-white jury. On parole for petty theft, the 29-year-old was living with his mom and working as a day laborer. His claims of innocence would fall on deaf ears, including those of his court-appointed lawyer. What do you do when you tell a lawyer that you're innocent and he looks at you and say, the problem with that statement, all of y'all always doing something in the moment you get caught, you say you didn't do it. What do you do with that? Despite the fact Ray had an ironclad alibi for at least one of the robberies and the lack of solid evidence, prosecutors pushed for a conviction. Their key piece of evidence, expert testimony claiming the ballistics report of the bullets pulled from the victims matched a handgun found in Ray's home. An all-white jury would find Ray guilty of two counts of capital murder and sentence him to death by electric chair. It's hurt so bad. Why me? What did I do? I even asked God, what did I do so bad? Ray's mother, Bueller, and his best friend, Lester Bailey, were crushed by the outcome. Your natural reaction was, it, it's over. He's going to be executed. At Holman Correctional Facility, Ray's cell was a mere 30 feet from the execution chair they called Yellow Mama. Ray would spend his time fighting not only a legal system that would block every one of his appeals, but the bitterness in his heart. The first three years, I was in a stage of hating. I hated the old men that did this to me. Ray began to realize the person he had become wasn't the one his mother had raised him to be a man who loved God and followed the example of Jesus Christ. I asked God to remove this hatred. But in order for me to be free, I had no choice but to pray for those men that did this to me. So Ray made a decision. If this were God intended for me to be and die, this is where I die. But while I'm here, everything around me going to live. I'm going to bring the best out of everybody that come in touch with me. One of those people was Henry Hayes, a KKK member on death row for lynching a black teenager. I truly believe God sent me to death row to meet Henry Francis Hayes and to show him what real love felt like and real love had no color. During their unlikely friendship, Ray saw God change Henry from a man full of hatred to one who knew God's love and had found redemption in Jesus Christ. Ray still remembers one of their last conversations before Henry's execution in 1997. I said, Henry, I truly believe that you're going to help. And Henry said, well, you know, Ray, I've been reading the Bible and I have changed my views on so many things. I finally looked at you as a human being. As for Ray, the courts would continue to block his appeals for a retrial. Then in 1998, the Equal Justice Initiative, or EJI, decided to take Ray's case. Among their efforts for criminal justice reform, the nonprofit provides legal aid to those who've been imprisoned unjustly. We just knew that it was just a matter of time, and we had the faith that one day it was going to be all right. EJI's probe into Ray's trial was disturbing. Among their findings, witnesses had been manipulated. Ray's defense counsel was inept, and the surviving victim's initial description of the assailant bore little resemblance to Ray. 
but it would be a single piece of evidence that held the key to proving Ray's innocence. EJI lawyer Charlotte Morrison explains. We hired three of the nation's best firearms experts, and they looked at the evidence, and they said, this, you know, there is no match here. The only evidence that the state ever had um, claimed connected Mr. Um, Hinton did not exist. Despite the new evidence, the courts still refused to reopen Ray's case. Then another crushing setback. Ray's mother, who had visited him almost every week since his incarceration, died in 2002. I don't think the society nor the men that did this to me realized what they took from me. Then, in 2014, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear Ray's case. By unanimous vote, the court ruled to grant Ray a new trial. I've always felt that I had the supreme lawyer. I don't believe the God that I serve is going to let me die for a crime he know I didn't commit. In April 2015, the state of Alabama dismissed all charges against Ray when state ballistics experts were unable to match the bullets to the handgun. Two days later, after serving 30 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, Ray was released. Only by the grace of God. I mean, only. That was a, an overwhelming day, and it should never have taken that long. For Ray, it was a bittersweet moment. For your mom not to be here the day that you were released, to run into her arm and say, I'm home, mom, is, I try my best to be the son that she brought me up to be. Now a community educator with EJI, Ray is doing what he can to bring reform to the justice system. He's also written a book about his journey of forgiveness and redemption, hoping his story will inspire change and healing. Jesus didn't say, hey, when an enemy come across you, I want you to hate him. That ain't what he said. Love your enemy. The only way that we will ever conquer hate is love. A remarkable story, and it's all here. He has written himself, The Sun Does Shine, and it's a story well worth the read. You know, no one would fault Ray Hinton for being bitter and angry and uh, wanting even retaliation for what was done to him. One of the things that was said in that story was that Ray made a decision. He said, this is not who I am. It's not who my mother raised me to be. And in spite of, in spite of all that was done to him, in spite of all that he lost, he made a decision to forgive he made a decision to do what Scripture says, to pray for your enemies. Boy, only God can help you and I to do that. But you know why he did it? Because he understood that he was captive to resentment, to bitterness, to anger, to unforgiveness, until he opened his hand and his heart and chose to let go, chose to do what God said. You know, in all of our lives, I think, things happen to us that are not easy to understand. Not only not easy to understand, things happen to us that are unfair. I mean, who could, who could have a story more unfair than Ray's? And yet we all have a choice. We all have that moment where we come to the fork in the road and we can either stay captive to the feelings and the, the hostility within us, or we can say, God, I'm gonna choose to do it your way. That's the thing we have the power to do. And it's the thing when we need help with it. He said, God, help me to do this. God shows up. You know, it's counterintuitive to everything that we think and feel and know in our lives, isn't it? I mean, everything in us wants to respond uh, and to respond hostily to someone who has done wrong to us. And yet God says there's a better way. Some of you today may find yourselves trapped in scenarios that have happened in your life that have been unfair, many of you. You know, it happens to all of us at one point or another. And then there's the question of what will we do with it? Will we allow it to define us, to define who we are, destroy us in some scenarios, keep us from a life of 
peace and joy and the harmony that God intended for us? Or will we choose to ask God to help us do what seems and feels impossible? If you're dealing with this in your own life, we want to encourage you to ask God to do what Ray did. Just God, come into the middle of my situation. Help me to do what doesn't feel right to me, but what I know comes from your very heart. I am willing. You know, you just have to be willing to say, God, help me. And then release it, give it to the Lord. In so many situations where things are unfair that happen to us, we can't change it. You can't go back and put spilled milk back in the bottle. It doesn't work, but you can let go of it and have a fresh beginning. We've got a special uh, piece we'd like to offer to you. It's called Forgiveness, and I love the subtitle, God's Power in Your Life. There is a power in forgiveness that you can't understand until you extend it to someone who doesn't deserve it. You see, that's what Jesus has done for us. And this forgiveness piece is available to you. It's just a matter of calling our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Call and say, I'd like the forgiveness piece. Let God do something miraculous in your life today when you agree to do things His way, when you make a decision. That's what Ray did. You can do that too. You can be set free. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The Omicron variant continues to surge across the United States. The daily average of new cases nearing 700,000. Surge is forcing more schools to return to remote learning. In Chicago, classes are canceled again today as teachers and the city battle over COVID-19 protocols. Meanwhile, the nation awaits the Supreme Court's ruling on President Biden's vaccine mandate, which will impact more than 80 million workers. Well, to celebrate the Christmas season and share the gospel in South Africa, CBN hosted an outdoor screening of Superbooks the first Christmas for local children. Despite COVID restrictions on many outdoor activities, CBN was able to partner with local organizations to provide the celebration to children from disadvantaged communities. The team was joined by hundreds of other children and parents from the general public over two days of screenings. The children were provided food, engaged in fun activities, and learned about the true meaning of Christmas. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com international. Well, Will is a Marine, and his wife, Rosa, has a full-time job taking care of their son. He has a genetic disease, and many of his medical costs are not covered by insurance. When this family depleted their savings account, they were staring at thousands of dollars or more in expenses. And then you came along to help them. All right, whose turn is it first? Balancing a military career and home life with two kids is no problem for Marine Gunnery Sergeant Will and his wife, Rosa. They've had plenty of practice. Will has deployed six times and counting. She was able to basically rock it while it was gone and not skip a beat. The couple carries a greater burden than the average family because their son suffers from cystic fibrosis, a rare progressive genetic disease that primarily attacks the lungs. Their daily routine includes multiple in-home lung treatments, a special diet, and countless supplements. From morning to night, it's a constant regiment between his pills and his supplements. It is so exhausting. It places a strain on this military family's budget, too. Lincoln's supplements are not covered by insurance. Plus, each time they transfer to a new duty station, they pay hundreds to prep their new home to create a sanitized environment for Lincoln. We get the ducts cleaned. And then we also set up a full house um, water filtration system. All the air purifiers for the house, it adds up pretty quickly. When they transferred to Texas, they prepared their home as usual. But Lincoln quickly became very sick. After racking up thousands in medical expenses and hospital stays, doctors confirmed Lincoln couldn't tolerate the Texas climate. The Marine Corps granted the family an emergency medical transfer. By then, the couple had depleted their savings and had to shell out money to prep their new home in California. Financially, they could barely hold on. It is only my income covering both adults and both children. I definitely think about 
financial hardships that we do face. Despite their difficult circumstances, Will and Rosa stood on their faith that God would sustain them. He gives us the strength to keep going every day. Their financial burden was lifted when North Coast Church asked helping the home front to step in. Pastor Brian Mouche started by telling the couple CBN was reimbursing them for the cost of preparing their home when they moved to California. And he told them CBN was covering the cost of all medical expenses they incurred in Texas. That's, that's amazing. We're so thankful for that. Thank you. That's it, you guys. For the next year, CBN is going to cover all expenses when it comes to your son's dietary and respiratory needs and all the supplements that come with that. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> that's so great, thank you. It absolutely uh, takes the, the weight off and, and the worry off. Will and Rosa are now financially back on their feet and are focusing on their family rather than worrying about money. We are so grateful to CBN and the people who give to CBN. We appreciate you guys lifting up our family and how much this will change some huge expenses in our life. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. You join with everything we do around the, around the world. If you want to see people helped in disasters, join the 700 Club. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. If you want to see the gospel preached around the world in multiple languages, Join the 700 Club. We're doing that. And another portion goes into the work of CBN International to do just that. Uh, the story you just saw was from helping the home front. We want to help our active duty military families. We want to recognize they're serving too. You're a part of all of it when you join with us. Now, how much is it? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents, to be, become, 65 cents a day to become a 700 Club member. We also have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month, 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. When you call and join, realize you're joining with tens of thousands of people that say, yes, let's make a difference in the world today. Now, when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, the bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you. Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs or downloads, either way, uh, that will encourage you, encourage your faith. So if you'd like that, ask for Pledge Express when you call or go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the giving page, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. We also have a new way to give where you can text us. You can text the letters CBN to 71777. Either way, do it now. Extreme chills, terrible trembling, excruciating pain. Bonnie battled a raging kidney infection for weeks on end. Then suddenly, she was healed one morning in an instant. And here's what happened. As a diabetic, Bonnie Grunke has had her share of infections over the years. The one that hit her in September 2020, however, would require more than medical science to heal. I woke my husband up and I says, I think I really need to go to the hospital. I mean, I could not stop trembling. I never had chills like this before in my life. It was terrible. In the emergency room, doctors discovered an abscess on her kidney, causing severe kidney infection. It covered 90% of my kidney. Well, I met the doctor and he says, it was a good thing I came in when I did because if I had waited much longer, I could have died. Bonnie was admitted and doctors gave her antibiotics to treat the infection and inserted a pick line to drain the fluid from the abscess. When the one pick line couldn't keep up, doctors added another. The second one was so painful I cried and I says, please Lord, stop this pain, just stop the pain. I mean, I was in terrible, terrible pain. Over the next several weeks, Bonnie would be in and out of the hospital. Every time doctors thought they had taken care of one infection, another would take its place. And I didn't just have one bacteria in there. I had several. The doctor told me he had never seen any, any type of infection like what I had. The pick lines having failed, doctors took Bonnie into surgery to insert a stent to help drain the fluids. Still, the infection raged on and Bonnie began losing hope. 
The house is a total disaster. I lived in the bedroom for three months. That was probably my low point. I felt hopeless and helpless. I was frightened. I really didn't want to die yet. Through it all, Bonnie turned to God for help and healing. I would pray to the Lord, and I would say, please, Lord, guide me, get me out of this. But I also, I would end with, thy will be done. If it's my time, I'm yours. It's not what I want, but what he wants. I want it to be healed. Then on December 2, 2020, Bonnie was watching the 700 Club when Pat and Wendy started praying for the audience. Somebody has a severe kidney infection. It's really, it's, use the term nephritis, it's really serious. And God, right now, you'll feel power in the, in the small of your back, and you'll feel heat, and you are healed in the name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness, that's me. I am claiming this. I hollered to my husband, Martin, I says, "Hun." And I told him what Pat Robertson said. And that, that morning, I was still all that nasty drainage coming out. It didn't drain for a while. And then all of a sudden, when it started draining, it was totally clear. I knew I was healed. Also gone was the pain. A month later at a follow-up appointment, Bonnie's doctor confirmed the infection and abscess was gone and removed the drainage tubes and stints from her kidney. The healing of my kidney has strengthened my faith. I knew there was no infection. I knew I was healed, and that brought my spirits up 110%. The Lord gives me my strength. Sometimes you may not even feel him, but no, he is there and he is carrying you. He's always there, he's always caring. He's always reaching out with hands of love and compassion to say, how can I care for you? How can I be with you? How can I forgive you? How can I save you? How can I deliver you? How can I heal you? When you have that kind of concept that he's a loving heavenly father, that he's vitally concerned with you, then faith becomes very, very easy. All you have to do is look to Jesus. He's the author, he's the finisher of your faith. Look to his sacrifice for you. Look to the lengths of things he went through so that you could be with him for all eternity. And when you look at that, well, then your problem gets very small and your God gets very big and your faith gets very easy. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some other testimony. People have been healed. Here's Elisa from Oregon. She has shoulder pain three months ago. While watching this program on December 11th, uh, just this past month, she heard Terry say, there's someone with a rotator cuff. It's not torn exactly, but it's very, very sore, especially when you move your arm around or you try to lift anything above the height of your shoulder. God is healing that for you. You're going to feel a warmth come into that part of your shoulder, and it's being all put back in place. Well, Alicia felt the warmth and the pain leaving. She is no longer feels any discomfort or aches and can freely lift her shoulder without pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yay. Well, Gordon, this is Mrs. Martin. She lives in Stanton, California. She injured her tailbone area and she was in tremendous pain. While watching the 700 Club one day, she heard you say, someone with a fractured tailbone, there is swelling and inflammation and a tremendous amount of pain. You can't sit. God is resetting that bone and taking that pain, swelling, and inflammation completely away. All of that pain just left you. Mrs. Martin claimed God's, God's healing power. The pain left. She's also shared a few months back, Gordon, you gave a word of knowledge, and her left knee was healed. So she is totally pain-free today, and she's rejoicing. She's yeah. Multiple. God loves to heal his children. Think about that. He loves to do that. What parent would ever want their child to be sick? to be in pain. So if, if we have that same concept here on earth, just imagine the outpouring of love and healing that is right there for you. All you have to do is look to him. All you have to do is look in faith, believing that he wants to. And when you do that, wonderful things can happen. So let's do that. I believe that when we act in faith, God responds. So in an act of faith, 
Lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Terry and I will agree with you, and God will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come just as little children believing in Daddy, that you want to heal us. You want to deliver us. You want to set us free. You want to save us. You love us this much. So stretch forth your hand to do signs, wonders, and miracles. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's someone you have a, a diabetic condition, and whenever your sugar levels um, get off, this is the sign for you. You have these splitting headaches. And God is healing you. He is healing your diabetes. Your, your, your sugar levels in your blood are going to be proper and regulated from this day forward. It's a tremendous miracle for you. That headache just left you. You were suffering in pain. That just left you. You're being released from it right now in Jesus' name. Terry? Yeah, there's a young woman. You've just had a baby, and... Um... You have serious infection in your, you're wanting to breastfeed, but you can't. You have this infection in your milk glands, and it's just not going away. You're in so much pain, but beyond that, you've not been able to enjoy your baby because of it. God's healing that for you right now. Everything is just going to go down, no swelling, no pain. Be free in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone, you're, you're a runner, and you went running recently, and you, you're not even praying, but God wants to heal you. Uh, in, in it's the back of your right thigh. You've got a um, hamstring injury, and I think there's a muscle tear as well. God's restoring all of that for you. He wants you to have life and have it abundantly. So he's, he's releasing you from all that pain. He's healing that ligament. Everything's going to be normal with it. What you couldn't do before, do it now. Start stretching that right leg and realize all of that twinge, all of that pain, all of that ache just left you right now. In Jesus' name. Yeah, there's someone else. You have a, a block in your right ear. You're hearing. You've lost some hearing, and you haven't prayed about it because you think it's not that big a deal. God's healing your right ear for you right now in Jesus' name. Well, someone else, you have pancreatic cancer. You've been told to put your affairs in order. God is, has not finished with you. You're going to get a tremendous miracle in Jesus' name. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalms. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.